Hey there, fellow classic comic collectors. As always, I'm Scott Harris King, and today I'm excited to finally bring to you, as of long promised, the first episode of my six-part podcast series where we do a super deep dive into Marvel's classic Star Wars series from the 70s and 80s. I'm joined by special guest, The Confessor. A couple notes about this. First of all, as always with my podcast, when I have a new guest, I do an interview with the guest so you can get some sort of idea of where they're coming from to understand their opinions. If you're not interested in listening to that, I'll have the timestamp down below where you can jump right to the discussion of the comics themselves. Secondly, this is audio only. I am going to add some visuals, basically just to cover whatever issues we're talking about, so you'll have that as a guideline, but it is audio only. So just to set your expectations, this was done before I started recording video of these conversations. This time in this first episode, we're going to be discussing the genesis of Star Wars at Marvel Comics. We're also going to be talking about issues 1 through 10, the original Roy Thomas era, which includes the adaptation of the comics in issues 1 through 6, and then the Star Hoppers of the Duba 3 storyline in issues 7 to 10. So, without further ado, we're going to take it away and jump right into the Star Wars, and I hope you enjoy. Now, what was the first comic that you ever read? Uh, that's a really difficult question because it was so long ago and I was so young um, that I don't really remember. I mean, my parents, my mum specifically, was buying me you know, old black and white UK reprints of, uh, you know, sort of Batman or kind of, there, there was a title called uh, Super Spider-Man, uh, which was kind of interesting because um, it was, it was a sort of a landscape comic and they printed two pages of kind of the US comics per sort of landscape page, like side by side. So it was an interesting sort of format, but I don't, I, I, I was definitely sort of reading that kind of thing, but I don't really remember uh, exactly the, the sort of earliest one I really remember unsurprisingly is um, uh, an issue of of Marvel's uh, Star Wars Weekly, um, which was reprinting the you know the regular US series, uh, and it was issue eighteen. That would have been about nineteen seventy eight at some point in nineteen seventy eight, which it basically reprinted part of the American uh, issue number nine. Um, so that was probably the earliest that I really remember. But even then, I was so young I couldn't really read them. So my my mum used to read them to me. It was like sort of storybook time. So other than uh, comics you might have reread for this podcast, what's the most recent comic that you've read? Most recent it was probably uh, an issue of astro city because that's really the only series that i get now i was really enjoying you know they were doing those um uh, the sort of republishing of the uh marble man or the sort of miracle man uh comics and then they stopped but i i've, I've heard that they're going to start those again with the you know sort of carrying on but yeah it would have been an issue of uh, a semi-recent issue of, of uh, astro city that would have been the last thing i read i'm a big fan of astro city how, what do you how do you yeah. feel about them ending the um the ongoing series uh I, well, if you're a long-term fan of Astro City, you're kind of used to that. You know, it's it's been sporadic since it began. The one I really remember that had massive, massive delays on it was, it was the, uh, you know, the Dark Age. That went on so long that it was, when well, it was like living through the 70s in real time. You know, it took that long, <laughs> which was detrimental, actually, to that whole arc, I think. Um, that's one of my least favorite arcs, and I think part of that is just the sort of, the, the way it was all broken up with those massive delays. Um, I think had it all come out over the space of 12 months, you know that it would have been it would have been a, a better read let's put it that way um and i've never revisited it so uh, that sort of speaks volumes i guess uh, so who's a creator that you think is underrated? There's a guy called Frank Hampson, who's a, a British, an illustrator, really, first and foremost. But he he's responsible for creating, writing and drawing uh, the Dan Dare uh, strip that ran in um, Eagle comic. And I, I mean, I don't know how much you know about, like, um, you know, Eagle and its sort of place within British British comics. But it's um, it's the, it's a really iconic, classic sort of, um, you know, comic, really. And it, it was um, released in the 50s and it's uh, people of my, my dad's age it's a real kind of they all remember it and they all sort of bought it and it was it was a really big thing and, and Dan Dare was like the, the sort of flagship strip but the artwork in it is I mean the writing's fantastic the characters are great but the artwork this lovely painted artwork with this wonderful kind of sort of future retro because it was made in the sort of post-war years I guess and so Space Fleet, which is like this kind of futuristic version of the RAF, basically. But they're 
all dressed in Second World War kind of bomber command sort of outfits, but they're flying these incredible spaceships. Uh, and then yet again, when you see inside the spaceships, the, the the sort of control panels all look like, you know, the control panels from like Lancaster bombers. So you've got this wonderful kind of mishmash of the really futuristic, sleek kind of sci-fi technology with this you know reading it from today's point of view this really archaic yeah kind of thing so yeah i i I think frank hampson would be my uh you know not enough people know him not even in this country and even if they know dan dare they might not know frank hampson you know so uh, who's a creator that you think is overrated this is a tough one because obviously i've heard the other sort of podcasts and i know these questions that you sort of ask at the beginning i mean i think anybody's really you know capable of doing good work Uh, at some point even if they're sort of uneven but you know the name that kept coming back to me when I was thinking about this question is is a relatively modern uh, writer called Jonathan Hickman who's um, he did did like a run on um, Fantastic Four and stuff like that uh, over the last sort of decade or whatever and I've read things about him being like that he's this amazing writer and he comes up with all these great ideas and I I followed particularly that uh, Fantastic Four run you know he has lots of good ideas but it just seems like he's throwing them all at the wall with no idea idea about how to sort of resolve anything and as a reader you you soon begin to realize that this isn't going to get resolved these things that have come out here that you think ah that's building towards something never are and in the end i just i gave up on him and i i I don't want to be nasty but i think he's a hack so who's a character that you love ah well i mean there's lots of them but spider-man would be number one if we're talking about pure you know comic characters easily spider-man is is number one with me you know i just think he i think he's one of the best characters and and also comic book series as well you know the supporting cast obviously and and the villains and all that kind of thing i think peter parker is a a hugely relatable character and he's a character that i've related to at sort of eight at 18 and probably at 80 if i live that long you know he's there's something about him that's uh i think it's very easy to see elements of yourself within that and that's always kind of you know hooked me into that character so yeah spider-man would be uh he'd be number one for sure it's interesting is you just remind me of um you know when i did the podcast with the roquefort raider he Hmm. was talking about how everyone talks about peter parker as being sort of the everyman but he he thinks you know since peter parker not only has the superpowers but is also like a super scientific genius that Hmm. he doesn't Hmm. really see peter as being that relatable i think that's a fair comment i mean I, i definitely can sort of see that but the thing i don't know the thing to me with peter parker is that you know sometimes real life is fantastical and sometimes you know i don't know it's like they always sort of talk about him you know having this sort of uh supermodel wife you know and, and and all the rest of that but i don't know i guess you know sometimes that that can happen and i always think particularly with the um you know how ditko used to sort of draw uh, uh, draw him as a very sort of scrawny angry not particularly sort of attractive or even particularly nice sometimes you know character uh, and then when john remiter took over you know he b- suddenly became Comes much better looking because that's obviously Remiter's kind of romance comics kind of thing kicking in. And but to me, that that the way that that, that transition happens, it, it, that is that's like real life to me. That's that's like you know the ugly duckling at school who kind of you know grows into himself kind of thing and blossoms and becomes this sort of you know. I still, uh, you know, I think there's something about him fundamentally that is hugely relatable. Certainly, that's my experience, and you know, I can only speak for myself, obviously. I don't know. There's something about the character that. <laughs> so, who's a character that you hate? Again, I'm just going with the first thing that came to my mind when I thought about this question earlier. I'm going to go with Thor. There's something about that sort of flowery kind of. Uh, I don't know whether it's supposed to be sort of you know what it's supposed to be, but that sort of quasi kind of uh, medieval sort of language, you know, where it's all like the and thus and uh, and that kind of thing. That I find that really annoying. And certainly in the sort of Silver Age appearances of his that I've read, you know, whether it be an Avengers. Or, or whether it be in his own sort of, uh, you know, his own title or whatever, I, I just find that uh, almost unreadable, you know. And then there's the, then there's the, 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 there's a soap opera with Jane Foster and all that in the early days as well. And you know, and, and uh, is it Donald Blake? Is that his name? Is he Doctor Donald Blake? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. He's so pathetic, and it's it's annoying. I mean, I don't know. I guess you know, you could also level a lot of those <laughs> accusations at Spider Man, at Peter Parker. But I think uh, by far, to me anyway, the standout of Marvel's. Um, the Silver Age output was Amazing Spider-Man. Um, 
and I don't know whether it was, you know, uh, uh, Steve Ditko kind of grounding Stan Lee a bit more and making it a bit a bit more sort of gritty. But when you compare it to something like, well, like Thor or, or even Fantastic Four or something like that, it's those comics seem a bit more ridiculous and not in a good way. <laughs> um, but that's just my, you know, my take on it, really. But yeah, Thor, I've never been a, fa- a fan of Thor. So if you were stranded on a desert island and had just one comic to read, a series or a collection or whatever what comic would you bring with you i probably i see that's really difficult isn't it because immediately i'd sort of think well you know like say the first 200 issues of amazing spider-man which i think makes like a complete story like they could have ended it at issue 200 and it would have been this complete coming of age story you know you didn't really need to go beyond 200 it was particularly with um you know peter parker running into the uh, uh the burglar again and, and aunt may finally getting over her uh fear of spider-man that would have been a really lovely place just to say well that that's the end you know but on the other hand you know it's like i'd be stuck there with all these um spider-man comics and uh, no marvel star wars so uh <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of difficult but um i think if i was going to say one issue if you were being really tough and you said to me it's got to be just one issue i'd probably pick something like amazing spider-man number five where he meets dr doom and like the fantastic four turn up at the end that's such a just a tour de force of you know kind of issue uh, everything in it and it packs so much into just those few pages and finally if you could have one dream comic any title any characters any creators living or dead what comic would you want to have created just for you i would really love if we're talking dream scenario i would really love to see a continuation of marvel's star wars comic as it was um i mean they can even put it out under like the sort of legends banner as they do with these things these days but uh, you know i'd really like to see you know the 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 creators that are still alive but also people like you know even even dear old um carmine infantino you know have him do a couple of issues just for old time's sake and things like that and it'd be nice to sort of carry on the story after after the last issue 107 but also at the same time do like kind of flashback things where you have uh new stories that were sort of set between the issues of you know earlier in the run kind of thing so yeah that would that would be a wonderful thing because i don't really like marvel's new star wars comics at all uh, i've read a few i jumped on board with those when they first started coming out and i just very quickly i don't know well, it's a perfect segue into talking yeah, about absolutely. Marvel Star Wars. <laughs> I, I think the story of Star Wars, just the comic even happened, is, is pretty interesting. There's a lot to go into, and Roy Thomas loves to go into it, because it, he seems like he talks about it all the time. So to hear Roy Thomas tell it, he first heard of Star Wars where he just happened to go out to dinner with George Lucas in 1975, and they just Lucas right. sort of mentioned that he was working on this project. But it was a year later where Lucas took Roy Thomas out to dinner again, and and pitched him the idea of Marvel doing an adaptation of Star Wars. That's right, but you. But did you know that there was like a sort of a pre uh, a pre thing where they where they approached Al Williamson prior to that, where so that would have been seventy five, and apparently Lucas himself actually approached Al Williamson and, and just you know said, would he be interested in drawing uh, you know a comic based on on the Star Wars as it was. You know, it was titled then. But uh, Williamson's, uh, I think his schedule, he was just too busy or whatever. He didn't, you know, he couldn't take it on. And of course, that's interesting because, you know, years later, he, of course, did the adaptation for The Empire Strikes Back. And, you know, clearly Lucas always because he george lucas was a big fan of like the ec sci-fi comics and the horror comics and that's where he'd first encountered al williamson so even before you know that that dinner with uh, george lucas and i think it was ed summer that roy thomas had that they'd already they were already kind of thinking you know that star wars would be a comic as well as a film basically what roy says is that uh, he wasn't aware of at the time but as you say they had approached other people first they had already been shot down at warren and at dc and that's right yeah, that's he, right. They had even already talked to Stan Lee, who also said no. Uh, but Roy well, there's a bit of there's a bit of a discrepancy about that. You know, some people say that they did, but Charles Lippincott, because he was the guy who was doing publicity. You know, he was really the one that Roy, I think, from what I can understand, dealt with much more than 
and George Lucas. He was the one who was really pushing. In fact, I've heard Lippincott say that that the actual idea, the the fundamental idea of having a Star Wars comic was his, and and he pitched that to George originally. Whether that's you know, it's a long time ago, and people have sort of conflicting memories, don't they? But um, so Lippincott says that he never even got through to to Stanley. And Ed Summer was this guy who he ran a, a very early sort of comic book shop in in New York, but he had a an original comic art gallery and George Lucas was like a silent partner in that and Ed Summer knew Roy Thomas very well and because of his friendship with George Lucas he also knew Charles Lippincott and that's how the thing the sort of that that's how Charles got to talk to Roy Thomas basically and he I don't think he'd even got through to Stanley I don't think he'd got any further than the secretary but then you hear Roy say it and it you know it seems as if actually he did have a meeting with Stanley and was as you say turned down so there are these little discrepancies in the sort of history of it really but um, who knows Roy mentions in the interview these discrepancies in this particular case not knowing anything other than just what I've heard I would Mm -hmm. tend to lean a little towards Lippincott only because Roy states clearly a couple times that he didn't know about any of this until after the fact so he was hearing second hand even at the time that they had already approached Stan Lee and been turned down what Roy says is that at the dinner they pitched him the story and he wasn't that into it both because he thought you know if Stan or I turned it down they didn't have a chance but also he didn't think science fiction would sell but when they got to the part where the showdown is at the cantina he realized it was really more like a space western and that was something that he was both thought right. would sell and was interested in doing a Himself. So he said that he would not only try and convince Stan to do the book, but he would write it himself. That, that's that's as I understand it as well. And I think because I think Lippincott turned up to that meeting at Marvel with a, a folder of uh, Ralph Macquarie's concept art, like the paintings, which are you know you, you, you must have seen those. They're quite quite famous now. But um, he brought those along, and it was yeah, absolutely that. That I think whether he had a picture of the cantina or or maybe it was just the description of it, but that is what that's what really hooked roy thomas initially you know that's what made him sort of think oh yeah this 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 could be good this could be something i could sort of get my teeth into now the other interesting thing that happened there is that uh, George Lucas specifically requested that Howard Shaken be brought on as the artist. That's right. Although only after uh, Al Williamson had turned him down. But, <laughs> but <laughs> no. yeah, that's right. That's right. And that was apparently on the strength of Shaken's strip, Cody Starbuck, which featured it was science fiction and it featured a main character who visually was similar in some ways to Han Solo. That's absolutely right. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. I can see the similarity, although sure. again, with Howard Shaken, all of his sort of leading characters look kind of of like the same guy just wearing different shirts right so anyway Roy went back and he was able to convince Stan to publish the book and I think part of uh, one of the key things that came into play here is that they had a really interesting and unique deal in terms of uh, the licensing costs, which is there actually weren't right. any off the top because George was looking at the comic as a way to get sort of free publicity. So Marvel didn't actually have to pay a licensing fee. They, It's my understanding that they only had to pay a percentage of sales over a certain amount. Like if they sold over 100,000 copies, then they would send a percentage of the extra sales to George you're absolutely right that it was it was first and foremost conceived as a as publicity for the film you know and and little more than that really uh, Lippincott particularly I think thought that um, you know fans of sort of uh, adventure movies or kind of sci-fi would also be into comics so I think he saw that as a very sort of natural kind of kind of pairing or whatever but my understanding is that absolutely the first six issues the the adaptation of the movie itself uh, they basically gave away to marvel for free and it would only be if if the series continued after that which would only happen if those issues sold well and if star wars the film was a success and all the rest of it the, it would be from like issue seven onwards that they would have to pay uh i don't know whether it's a licensing fee or a royalty or whatever it is but but that you might be right maybe it was free but only up to a certain number but that's that i i'd not heard that before but you might be right yeah well, there's, there's a lot of conflicting information, but, yeah, uh, but I have yeah. heard also, again, what you say there, where they would only have to pay the fees if, you know, if they continued. One thing that um, Roy says is even with this deal in place, there were still people in the company that were against them doing the Star Wars book. Obviously, this became a huge success, but of course, it was an untested thing. Who knew it was going to be that big? And, and you know, obviously, there were people, bean counters, I guess, in, in Marvel or whatever, who were kind of 
you know, thinking that this was going to be, you know, a terrible disaster. Well, Marvel's production manager, John Vorporton, was one of these bean counters. What Roy says is that he desperately tried to convince Roy to only do a two-issue adaptation instead of six because he was convinced they were going to lose so much money publishing oh, the really? comics because no one was going to buy them. And Roy threatened to quit the book if they didn't do it as a full six-issue adaptation. Again, I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. That's, that's interesting because it works really well as a six-issue thing. And I know that I know that Roy Thomas was really, um, you know, wanted to. He felt that you couldn't do it in any less than than six. But I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know that they had actually proposed that it would be shortened. Once they got to work on the book, a couple interesting things. Firstly, because it was conceived as something that would act as promotion for the comic they scheduled it so that the first two issues would be published before the movie actually came out which means they had to start working on the book like a whole almost a whole year in advance and they didn't mm. have any footage from the film they were just working off of Ralph McQuarrie's drawings and the script and they also had a chance uh, to go to what would become you know uh, industrial light and magic uh, to have like visit the, the set and see some of the special effects stuff so they would have an idea of what Chaikin mm. was even supposed to draw that's right and um yeah it was based on on the shooting script much as the um novelization that came out in 1976 was and that's you know one of the interesting things about it that it sort of preserves in comic form this you know this version of star wars that's very close to uh, what we saw on the on the finished screen but in, in you know at the same time is is quite different in, in in some ways as well one thing that's interesting is that they ended up taking some of their first to sort of like conceptual work for the comic and going to San Diego Comic-Con in 1976 and putting on what was one of the first ever sort of movie centric panels at Comic-Con to hype an upcoming project and there's some there's some really interesting photos from the Comic-Con where I've seen those they're yeah. wearing like uh, t-shirts with the original Star Wars logo and before. with the bearded the bearded Han Solo holding a lightsaber as well like that really early version of the Luke and Han with the same character sort of thing yeah I've seen those I've seen those pictures that's a really cool t-shirt as well that they're wearing but uh, yeah I, th I think that was I mean that's obviously really commonplace now isn't it with San Diego Comic-Con I mean it's more of a, a movie thing as I understand it than, it than it is a comic thing anymore but um, I think back then in I think it was July 76 wasn't it that San Diego Comic Con was on then and yeah they had that and also Chaikin had that poster you know the, the, he, he drew the um, poster the cover of issue one of the Marvel series he's based on uh, and he was selling that and it was yeah it was just trying to drum up publicity for the for the comic and then you know by proxy the film itself that kind of thing you know one other thing I just wanted to mention this is really more of an anecdote that didn't really have too much of an effect on things but Roy does say that he got to attend one of the first test screenings of the film yeah yeah yeah, yeah I've heard that yeah and the test screening sort of became well known in movie circles because the, uh, <laughs> Lucas thought it was a disaster and he had several other key people there with him that sort of helped him fix certain aspects. I think for the purposes of what our discussion is, the most interesting thing is that uh, Brian De Palma was there and he basically ended up rewriting the opening crawl because he thought that what George had was just too expository. So what we see in the finished film, the writing there is from Brian De Palma, but that was done mm. after the screening with Roy Thomas and after they'd already worked on the first issue. So That's right. when we start off issue number one, uh, Star Wars number one, the first page, we get the famous opening crawl and it's completely different yes. in the comic than it is in the uh, movie. A really convoluted and really wordy. I mean, it needed rewriting without without any shadow of a doubt. Um, but yeah, and that's one of the, one of the sort of interesting uh, things about about it and and the thing is you know even when like if Roy Thomas saw this um early sort of edit uh, you know Star Wars that movie changed so much from edit to edit there's there's a cut of Star Wars in the you know the Lucasfilm vaults or whatever that's almost like a comedy and there's bits of it that it's cut very much like a comedy and there's 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 these bits in the film that you know are almost kind of leaning towards sort of slapstick and of course in the version that we all saw when it came out of the cinema all of that is kind of eradicated but, but there are little bits of it left like for instance um if you recall the scene where um they're sneaking through the death star this is after they've come out of the 
trash compactor and it's uh, Han and Chewie and, uh, and Luke and Leia and they're sneaking through but well, there was this whole kind of scene in this rough cut where they're sneaking through in a really kind of pantomime over the top sneaky kind of way and actually if you look in the finished film there is a scene where they're just coming along this corridor and you can see that they are kind of hamming it up like that so there are if you know what you're looking for there are little bits of that and the crawl is another you know another sort of thing like you know i mean i've even heard that in the original shooting script that the death star didn't attack yavin base and that was something that was concocted in in the final edit you know which i i don't know whether that's true but it just goes to show you that the, the, the film did change a lot. And, of course, poor old Roy Thomas is walking, working off of this uh, shooting script that is you know, the same but also significantly different to, to what ended up on the screen. Well, I, not to get into the movie versions too much, but that no. sort of jibes with what I've heard in that. It's my understanding that Luke's wife at the time, Marshall. Marshall, Lucas, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically saved the film and a lot yeah. of what you see in in the movie is her in the editing room taking the stuff that was filmed and making like an actual story particularly in in the third act of the climax she added a lot of stuff there in terms of cutting it together so it was much more dramatic than what George had originally written. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. You know, again, without jumping ahead too far, but it might be that the last part, the issue number six, was sort of retooled quite a lot after it was, you know, after sort of Howard Chaykin had kind of worked on it a little bit because of edits that were made that then Marvel were informed about. Because I think I'm right in saying that there's, there's lots of different sort of creative people on that last issue. It's a bit of a mess in, a t- in terms of who was actually working on that. And I do wonder if that was because suddenly the things had changed and, and it was like, oh, OK, we've got to at least try and make the comic fit that a little bit better, you know. Yeah. And one thing I did want to mention, speaking of sort of a, kind of a mess because there's too many hands involved. One of the things that went sort of haywire right off the bat with the series is they had specifically requested Shaken be the artist, but it turned out right. he wasn't fast enough to do it. So within just, I think even by issue two, maybe they were already having to bring people in to help him finish the artwork. Uh, that's right. And yeah, I mean, thank God, because you know i mean howard chaykin is obviously you know a great artist but you know for years i used to think that that first issue which is him on pencils and ink so he's he's doing everything basically on the art you know i used to think god it's so sort of messy and sort of scratchy and scribbly you know and every time you'd see uh, anybody talking about it they'd always sing the praises of howard chaykin's art and i and even in the letters page of, of the comic itself by about issue two or three you've got people saying oh it's wonderful you know artwork by um by, by chaykin uh, and i was always thinking really is, is it really that good? And of course, in more recent years, I've actually seen Howard Chaykin himself saying, yeah, you know, basically I dialed it in. You know, it was, if I'd have known how big it was going to be, I'd have put a lot more effort into it, that kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be too down on him because actually, you know, the sort of, the staging and the sort of panel to panel flow and the action sequences particularly in that first issue are fantastic. And that's obviously all, all Chaykin, but I do think it looks rushed as if his heart isn't really in it. Whereas I think it was Steve Lealoa who comes in to sort of do the inking and probably a lot of embellishing, I would think, on issue two. And it has a really different look to it, a much smoother sort of line, if you like. Yeah, they're an interesting art team because just in general, Steve Lealoa, his art is, is much finer and it's much smoother. Chaykin stuff you know even after this point got more and more blocky and chunky and uh, mm, so mm. Th- they're they're kind of an oddball mix but as we're going to see going through the star wars comic had sort of a long tradition of really strange art teams so this is just getting things off to a you know, <laughs> good start so these first six issues which adapt the series i find them to be really interesting as we discussed they were working from the script and so there's a lot of stuff in here that's that wasn't in the movie and so i find it to be as someone who has seen the movie of course many times and grew mm. up you know as a star wars fan seeing some of the elements in the comic particularly the big subplot which runs through the first two issues and then comes back around at the end that was almost completely dropped from the movie what you have to understand about the star wars comic and this is to me anyway this is really important when star wars came out you know it was before there was any kind of home video or anything like that as i'm sure you know and, and you, you know you'd go and see the film and if you were lucky you maybe go and see it two or three times 
times. But in terms of, you know, your sort of daily kind of connection with this with this world of Star Wars that you love so much, it was the comic, really. And, and like, you know, the Kenner action figures, I guess, you know. And that's the thing, you know, when I, I, I missed... You see, I missed the early issues when they first came out in the UK. It wasn't until the uh, immediately sort of, um, you know, the Star Hoppers of Aduba 3 storyline that I jumped on but i think it was christmas 78 there was an annual that came out in the uk that had the adaptation those first six issues and that's where i first saw them and for me you know that was the star wars movie uh in you know i mean i'd obviously seen it at the cinema but in terms of revisiting it as you might do on you know on dvd or blu-ray today if you have a favorite film back then you couldn't do that so it was it was it was the comic or nothing and i always sort of i mean i always really loved that whole kind of big thing i mean i understand why it was dropped from the film it was it made the beginning of the film too too uh, slow and they needed to get on with the story and get and get luke to to moss Eisley and, and and the rest of it but but i always kind of like that and of course as you say it ties round into the last issue when you know biggs is there and then of course when biggs dies you know that has a much more sort of weight to it than it does in the film because in the film he's he's just another rogue pilot really for all intents and purposes you know one thing that really struck me reading this as someone who did not was not reading these at the time because my first issue was issue 95 so oh. like i came very late into the comics is the experience of reading these comics at the time they were coming out must have been very very different because since empire hadn't come out yet this is basically the stories in the comics. That's what you have for two or three years. There's novelizations as well and, you know, the Christmas special and stuff. But basically, if, if you want to know what's going on with the characters or be involved with the characters, the co- these comic book stories, this is what you have. And it, it seemed to me like if you, if I was a kid at the time, this events happening in the comic, especially continuing right in issue seven, like picking up where the movie left off, it would be just as real to me as the movie stuff. I mean, absolutely. And I... In fact, a little confession, which is going to sound stupid now, but you have to remember I was only a little kid at the time. But I actually thought that those comics carrying on were like going to be the next film. I sort of I didn't realize that they were just for the comic. I thought that that was absolutely real Star Wars. You know, when they would throw out details of of sort of you know even just things like the drinks they were drinking or the type of food they'd have. You know, I'd really absorb all that, and I'd really sort of you know they call it the expanded universe now, but really that was that was the expanded universe that was you know it's what gave us particularly in the uk i think because it was a weekly comic rather than a monthly comic it really did mean that you'd have this new star wars adventure turning up on the news agent's shelves or coming through your letterbox with the daily paper or whatever once a week and it was a very real that was star wars you know that yeah it was important it was as important as the movie in in, in its own way you know i find it really interesting i want to talk about this more as we go because there's a couple things that happen in the comic that I feel like must have really colored how the movies played out for people that were reading the comic, particularly with the character Lando Calrissian. You know, reading those issues when we get to them, um, it struck Mm. me, you see Empire Strikes Back, Lando's in 10 minutes. But then you've got, in the comics three years worth of stories with Lando Calrissian. So when Mm. you get to Return of the Jedi as a movie, for people who've been reading the comics, this was a much bigger, more important and fleshed out character than he was to anybody that had only seen the films. Absolutely. Absolutely that. And that's that's a really good example, actually, of how, yeah, the comics sort of helped flesh out characters like that. And and, and it meant that when you went and saw the next the next installment at the cinema, that you had a much better understanding of, of those characters. So there's a couple other things that jumped out. There are other things, you know, like the big subplot. There's other details from the original scripts that are not mm. in the movies. One thing that I noticed that's going to come into play later a couple times and end up being weird in retrospect is that there's the scene with skinny Jabba the Hutt in this yeah 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 and I love that Jabba the Hutt I really do do you know when return and again this ties into what you're saying about how the comics flashed out uh, sorry fleshed out those those characters because because he appears the skinny you know uh, Jabba the Hutt uh, appears again another couple of times in the series before the Empire Strikes Back so and I can really remember that, that when 
I was excited that Jabba was going to appear in Return of the Jedi. But when I first saw the picture of what Jabba looked like, I was really like, eh? that's, that's not Jabba the Hutt. And that's a really good example of, 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 of how Al, the comic series kind of, you know, changed your expectation, I guess. If you weren't following the, the comic series, you'd have seen the big slug like Jabba that we all know and love and you'd have just accepted it. But I definitely remember there being a couple of months there when Return of the Jedi came out where I was really like, Oh, I really don't like that Java. You know, he's, he's nowhere near as good as the one from the comic. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. For those who haven't read the comic or aren't super into um, like deep cut Star Wars stuff in the comic, <laughs> they had filmed with the original movie. They filmed the scene where Han talks to Jabba, and they had a skinny humanoid person playing Jabba the Hutt. But George didn't like the way it looked. He didn't like what they could do with the special effects. So they cut that scene. It was eventually restored in the extended edition in the remastered version in the 90s where they made it into a Jabba who is still slug-like but is it was skinnier than he is later. But mm. because Roy and uh, Howard were and the other artists were working from the script and from the Macquarie drawings and, and, you know, the early footage, they thought that that skinny Jabba that they had filmed uh, originally was going to be the finished Jabba. So we have this humanoid guy uh, called Jabba the Hutt who appears in, in several issues, as you say, of the series here and bears no resemblance at all other than name to the character we eventually got in Return no, of the Jedi. That's, that's right. The actor that they shot in that Docking Bay 94 Jabba the Hutt scene that was ultimately cut from the film, the idea was always to superimpose like some kind of alien over him. So they had, obviously they didn't bother doing that, but as you say, you're absolutely right that the effects were not up to, you know, up to sort of scratch and also that scene's completely surplus to requirements because you've also you've already learned everything you need to know about Han and Jabba's relationship from Greedo in the earlier scene in the cantina. You don't actually learn anything new in that scene at all. So it was definitely right to, to cut that. But they, they were, along with the footage and the shooting scripts and all that, they were also given, um, Howard Chaykin and Roy Thomas were also given lots and lots of, of stills, like on-set stills. And that, that Jabba the heart, that creature that, turned up in the Marvel adaptation and later issues as Jabba the Hutt is actually an alien from the cantina or at least from around Mos Eisley. And if you look in the film, uh, in the background of some of the scenes, you can see him. And then, of course, you know, the expanded universe being what it is, you know, years later uh, in the 90s or whatever, that character was actually given a name, which I think is something like um, uh, uh, Mosset need or something like that I'm, I'm probably murdering that but he was yeah it wasn't something that they just came up with that was that was an alien that was in Mos Eisley and they just decided to take it because they didn't really know what what, what Jabba looked like another couple things that are interesting about the original six issue adaptation are some places where I felt like they were able to in the comic book form I don't want to say improve on the movie but they were able to add certain elements that you couldn't get from the movie specifically the characters have thought balloons uh, so mm. you can mm. sort of get inside the heads of the characters in a way that you can't in the movie but there's also bits that make a little more sense in the comic book like you see at the end of the movie um, you see Luke using the force earlier on to help him shoot down some TIE fighters. Uh, so when it happens at the end, it's like a natural progression. I mean, I like the right. way it is in the movie too, but, um, <clears throat> and then there's a thing here, which may actually lead into the next thing we're going to discuss, but they mention this is a big, sticking point with me but at the end of the movie <laughs> they don't give chewbacca a medal right but in the in the comic they mention that they do which is brilliant and i always loved that as a kid because it used to piss me off as well you know it's like yeah. well why didn't chewie get one <laughs> you know i was really excited that they gave chewbacca the medal and then later on in the uk weekly they did a whole story where we got to see chewbacca get his medal that i was really happy to to read that because that's something that's always really bugged me you know, I think that was pretty, uh, pretty widespread. Something I did just want to say, just backtracking slightly, when we were talking about the scenes like with Biggs or with Jabba the Heart that weren't in the movie, what's really interesting about that is that actually Marvel got a lot of letters from irate fans who, were, who accused Roy Thomas of inserting his own made up scenes into the story. So after issue six, the movie's over and mm. Marvel has been doing well with the comics. Now it's interesting. One thing that's 
been said a number of times is that Star Wars saved Marvel Comics, but it's a little bit hard to figure out exactly the sales figures and the money involved and the math involved. I've heard yeah. mm. that eventually Star Wars 1 ended up selling, number one, sold over a million copies. Now, that number doesn't really make sense to me in terms of the initial publication figures, because I think when it first came out, it was, you know, it was before the movies, before the phenomenon, and I suspect that it was just a regular print run of 200 to 300,000 copies however later or less. on it, it yeah. may have been it may have been less yeah but later on they when the comic became popular they had this deal with Whitman where they reprinted issues one to three in one poly bag set of three and then issues four to six in another one and those were available for years for sale and I so I suspect the figures that have been bandied about about Star Wars number one selling over a million copies it has a lot to do with how many copies of those reprint sets and I suspect that it was probably if you look at if they had the figures both of the, all six of the first uh, six issues in reprints probably sold about the same i'm sure i'm sure that you're absolutely right because don't forget i mean marvel reprinted those early issues at least three times but forget the whitman bags you know there were so like issues one two and three at least uh, maybe some of the other ones were reprinted uh, like the second prints the only way you can tell them is there's the uh, indica at the, at the bottom but the third prints actually have the word reprint on the uh, on the spine and then there was the whitman bags there was also the oversized treasury uh, editions which they published so they published one treasury that had issues one to three then they published a second treasury that had four five and six and then just for good measure they published a third treasury with all six in then you had the um the the paperback book sized reprint which was black and white but yeah it was reprinted a lot and then of course you know you have like the uk reprints where it was reprinted in in star wars weekly that it was collected in an annual for christmas and then it was yeah you know so it was reprinted a lot even in that first sort of year never mind how many times it's been reprinted since you know so marvel was raking money in hand over fist thanks to star wars it came at a perfect time because the comic industry had a huge problem in around 78 like dc's implosion happened thanks to the blizzard mm. 78 sort of destroying distribution here in the northeast united states for you know a couple months and it's been said that that marvel that money kept marvel afloat but one thing that's going to be important to the development of the series is that this was before the creative team was getting royalties for sales figures so all of this money Roy Thomas himself was not seeing a cut of it and that is one of the factors that I don't want to say that's why he left the book but he didn't have the incentive to stay on the book it after. was a contributing factor I yeah. think I mean yeah reading in between the lines that was definitely part of it but not yeah not the not the whole thing at all so before he left we get a second arc but simultaneously to the arc that runs through issues 7 through 10 there's also another story by Roy Thomas that was being serialized in the pages of Pizzazz. That's right, yeah. Pizzazz yeah. was a magazine that was aimed, at, it's like a multimedia thing aimed for kids that was all about pop culture and it, they had this story where they had three pages of this Star Wars story taking place in each issue and that seemed to be mainly because there was no other reason for kids to buy pizzazz so they would put like the Star Wars characters on the covers as often as possible and I think the story inside was basically just a justification for having them on the cover to try and I, sell copies. Yeah. I think that's right and the other thing is well with pizzazz it was aimed at it's weird really because you sort of look at what was covered in it you think oh that's aimed at teenagers but if you look at adverts for it when um stan lee you know might mention it in the sort of bulletin thing in in in, in comics of that era it, it's clear that it's being aimed at a much much younger audience so you know kids like eight and below and uh, the writing in that star wars strip is is very much like that it's definitely written for a much younger audience than the regular and the artwork is i mean you know as i've said before i think by his own admission you know i think howard chaykin was sort of dialing it in a little bit with the regular uh comic book series but he was definitely dialing it in with, with the uh, pizzazz trip and it, it's not a particularly great story but it's it's no. clearly written for children and because of that they're not even assuming that you've seen the movie the, so they're they're explaining who the characters are and their personalities like in every issue but the, the, the weird thing is because it's terrible i mean it really is a bad read you know even you know through rose tinted nostalgia glasses you know it, it's a terrible terrible read but it's really important as a story because it was the very first 
uh, you know, expanded universe story. It was the very first story to be created in the Star Wars universe that wasn't the Star Wars movie itself. So it, it, from that point of view, it's it's notable, you know, if, if nothing else. The other thing that's interesting is that Roy Thomas being who he is, he seems to have, an, in a sneaky way, been paying really close attention to continuity because this story has Luke and Leia and the droids in it. And while that's happening in Pizzazz, the story that's going on over in the pages of Star Wars itself, in issues 7 to 10, is almost exclusively about Han and Chewie. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never really thought of that. Because I'd always just thought, because you're, you're absolutely right, there's no Han, there's not even any mention of, of, of Han or, or Chewbacca. Um, and of course... It, that it shares that with um you know alan dean foster's um splinter of the mind's eye novel that came out uh later on that that same year and my understanding from the alan dean foster novel was that he assumed or was told by lucas or whatever that once the death star was destroyed you know han had his reward and that was it he was done with the rebellion and he he basically left and i'd always assumed that the pizzazz strip doesn't feature Han or Chewie for the same reason, but actually, you might be right. Maybe it was, yeah, maybe that's exactly why they weren't in it because they were being featured in the regular comic. You know, that's that's really interesting. I'd not thought of that. Well, it feels like a very Roy Thomas thing to do. Yeah, you might well be right. You might well be right. That's uh, yeah, it's food for thought. <laughs> so, in terms of Roy Thomas's contributions to Star Wars, of course, we've already talked about a lot of it. But for comic book fans, I feel like his arc in issues 7 to 10 of Star Wars is where he really put his stamp on the property. Uh, it's his yeah. last arc. It's the it's the only one that takes place, you know, a after the film. And he does a has a, introduces a lot of characters that have become sort of both famous and infamous and does some interesting things in a story that is essentially a retelling of Seven Samurai. Which I suspect was an intentional homage to the fact that Star Wars itself was heavily based on another Akira Kurosawa film, The Hidden Fortress. Hence, Seven Samurai. Yeah, or Magnificent Seven, depending on your preferred version. But yeah, absolutely that. Uh, and it's a western, isn't it? I mean, it is. I mean, it's you know, it's an unabashed western. And you, you know, you were saying earlier about how what really hooked him was like the sort of cantina sequence and the, the, the you know he realized that it had like sort of western kind of elements to it and that's what hooked him so it's no sort of surprise and i think han and chewie were his favorite characters anyway so that's you know why why i think he sort of focused on them it's an interesting story really that that sort of four issue arc the sort of star hoppers of a duba three arc as it's kind of known because i mean i like it i mean it's got it's not perfect it has its flaws but i generally really like it and especially because it was where i started buying the star wars comic in the uk it was while that story arc was running so it you know it obviously has a, a nostalgic thing for me that i can't really separate from the sort of critical brain you know but yeah i think it was it's it's sort of interesting but it's it's not really that star warsy in a way i mean there's luke and leia are hardly in it uh, certainly there's no mention of like the empire really i mean only you know kind of in passing it's, it, it's good but is it really what people wanted after you know star wars there's no darth vader in it there's you know it's it's uh, it's a, sort of a weird one to start off with in a way I agree. I think it's uh, interesting. There are several things from my perspective that, that take place here that we're going to see uh, sort of continue throughout the series. For me, as you mentioned, it just doesn't feel that Star Wars. And I felt like that happens a lot, uh, particularly with fill-in issues, but even with the, the main creative team, whoever it is at the time, where they'll have a story. Sometimes it's a science fiction story. Other times there are stories that are clearly from other genres that are being put in the Star Wars universe. And the Star Wars characters or setting are kind of incidental to the story when you get something like this where yeah it's got star wars characters in it but it doesn't feel star wars like star wars has a very specific feel that's a little bit hard to quantify but you sort of it's like pornography you know it when you see it and <laughs> yeah this, Good, well, this is like right off the a top. strange analogy but yeah okay <laughs> I, I, I can i can roll with that yeah go on this is a story where it just doesn't feel like star wars it's not to say it's bad for what it is but what it is just doesn't and part of that for me is 
uh, is the art. So, I mean, the thing is, the, the thing is with it, I, I don't know that I would go quite as far as to say that it's not Star Wars at all. I think, I think it has elements of that, but I think it has things missing from it that you would expect to see in a Star Wars comic, particularly the very first original Star Wars comic. Like you would expect the Empire, at least, if not Darth Vader, but certainly the Empire to be a much bigger presence in it. And I guess you'd want to see Luke and Leia a bit more than you do as well. I mean, great as as Han and Chewie are, you know, back then Star Wars was subtitled as From the Adventures of Luke Skywalker, and he's barely in it. So things like, it's almost what's missing is, is the problem rather than sort of what's there. But... You know, you have to remember this was very early days of of Star Wars and the sort of Star Wars feel or the aesthetic that you're talking about, which we all know, just like pornography, that's something that's been firmed up over the years and particularly with other films that came out when this um star hoppers of aduba 3 this first post movie storyline came out it was still very uh fluid really like what star wars really was you only had one film to go on and i think even in the adaptation like the force the concept of the force i mean we all understand that that's like a pop culture icon now you know we all know the force we know what that is but back then it was much less sort of clearly defined and in the adaptation there's yeah i can't remember what issue it is at all but there's definitely one part in it where in the narration boxes roy tries to describe what the force is and how luke is using the force and he sort of describes it as like luke kind of tapping into the brotherhood of man which i always just it makes me laugh because it just sort of sounds like i think in my reviews i described it as a very hate ashbury kind of version of the force really you know it was so yeah i think you have to also read these stories realizing that that star wars aesthetic was not as well established and as well defined as it as it is now you know as i mentioned i had some trouble with the art this is still chaken phoning it in but now they've brought in a little bit of help for him from what I understand, Tom Palmer did a lot of heavy lifting. You know, Marvel released the big Star Wars omnibus, uh, omnibuses, you know, the, the yeah. three volume thing. They've got loads of stuff in the back. They had some original pencils of Howard Chaykin and the look of some of the star hoppers the so-called star hoppers was really different and even um, particularly you know don juan quixote terrible name terrible name he he looked really different so i think i think actually tom palmer did an awful lot of you know embellishing I, it wasn't just i think frank springer as well might have done the embellishing and inking on the very first one but most of that arc is tom palmer i think i'm sure that he did lots of embellishing because you don't bring tom palmer onto a book unless you want him to basically take over the art. to put his style on it right and but that, that's great i mean i'm a big fan of tom palmer i think he's great you know life is just better with tom palmer you know it's like everything is better with a bit of tom palmer that's the way i you know yeah you know i think i understand some people criticize him because he he, ha he has such a strong sort of stamp that he puts on things that you can't really see much of what he's inking over really he really dominates but howard shaking i don't think his heart was really in it and i think again that's another contributing factor to why roy threw in the towel after issue 10 because clearly you know roy thomas was hugely passionate about star wars and really got into it and um you know the, uh, i think what with you know like we've talked about the sort of the royalties and stuff from those first six issues but i think another contributing factor was that i think he felt that howard chaykin wasn't really their body and soul in the same way that he was you know uh it wouldn't surprise me at all but we do know there's another big factor so i wanted to talk about the characters that he introduces as part of his uh, oh, yeah. his uh, team here. <laughs> now, you've you've already mentioned Don Juan Quixote, and I and I want to talk about him specifically, as well as of course Jackson. But let's let's save Jackson oh, yeah. for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Don Juan Quixote is interesting to me for a couple reasons. One is that it's an absolutely terrible, terrible joke. It's just, I think it's not something like this is me just projecting in retrospect. But if I was an adult, not a kid, as a kid, I wouldn't know who that is. As an adult, if I just come from seeing the movie and I read this, this is not what I would be looking for because 
it's so corny and jokey that, it, you know, as a fan, I want the material to be taken seriously. And it doesn't feel like Roy is necessarily taking it that seriously when he introduces a character named Don Juan Quixote, who thinks that he's uh, a Jedi, but isn't, or is he? Well, well, this is the thing, isn't it? I mean, at the time, I had no idea who Don Juan was. The, the, the name that uh, did totally over my head. Uh, I think I probably did know about Don Quixote, and I probably did pick up on the sort of similar sounding name or, you know, or, or whatever. But is he really a joke character? You know, I mean, yes, the name's terrible, and the way that he talks in the sort of ye olde knights of old kind of, you know, vernacular or whatever is, is kind of cringe inducing but at the same time it, i think he's quite an interesting character really because you know it like you say is he a jedi knight or is he just deluded or is he both you know is he a deluded jedi knight you know this is and it's i love the fact that that's left ambiguous you know i, I think he's actually it's a shame that the name uh, makes him into a joke character because actually you know he is quite an interesting character although i temper that by saying i don't know what the hell Han Solo was thinking about, you know, having him on the team. He seems like a complete liability. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to, if you're trying to get like a, a crack unit of of mercenary spacers to sort of, you know, defeat these sort of bandits, he's the last person you'd pick. But you know, um, so I don't think it's as easy as that. I don't think it's as easy to sort of say, oh, that was just a jokey thing. Certainly, as a kid, I didn't think of him as a jokey character. I mean, I, I get the joke now. I, I I see it now, and I get the play on the play on words with the name and stuff like that but at the time i sort of i kind of did think that was serious you know and maybe that's the maybe roy knew what he was doing maybe he was writing for that audience of eight nine year old ten year olds or whatever you know well it's one thing that that, that i do find interesting about the character i i agree he's not a jokey character exactly it's it's just a, a weird decision to me uh for for roy to pick that name even though i can see where he's coming from because he does the character is modeled after don quixote in the way he acts as well uh but it's interesting that yeah sure there were certain yeah. restrictions that we know we're going to talk about this in a second that were placed on the book where they couldn't do certain things they couldn't explore certain topics and throughout the series we're going to see other characters that may be different in personality from Don Juan Quixote, but serve the same role as sort of stand-ins for the Jedis. We see throughout here a number of different characters as the series goes along, people who may or may not have been Jedi Knights, who want to be Jedis, who have some sort of Force connection, and almost always they're sort of one and done characters because they can't really get into it it feels to me like the writers throughout the series they want to get into the jedi mythology but they're not allowed to so they keep creating these sort of uh, analogs that they can use in place of the jedi to do the best they can to explore it at least a little bit yeah and i think a lot of that is down to the restrictions that that Lucasfilm put on, you know, on the comic famously, you know, uh, with, with the character of Jackson. I mean, apparently from what we hear, what you read and what, you know, as we understand that George Lucas absolutely hated that character, you know, and, and, and I think again, that was another reason why Roy Thomas decided to move on because I think he was like, Oh, okay. You know, I'm creating these characters. I'm trying to do my best with the, with this universe and trying to grow this comic book series uh, and all i'm getting is knockbacks you know from from the the powers that be at lucasfilm so yeah i think you're exactly right and i think the the joe duffy uh, parallel is important because we're going to see this throughout the run where the authors the, the writers and creators are being stifled by demands from Lucasfilm. Roy has said not only did he get the feedback that they hated Jackson, so he wasn't supposed to use Jackson anymore, they just didn't like it, but he says in uh, the introduction to one of these various volumes that he had specifically been told certain things. He couldn't explore the relationship between Luke and Leia because they he didn't they wouldn't tell him why, but they, mm. hadn't, they wouldn't let him do that, and they wouldn't let him use Darth Vader at all because they didn't know what they were going to do with him, and so he was told he couldn't do this, he couldn't couldn't do this he couldn't do this and then when he did something else then they complained about what he actually did and so since he was getting all this negative feedback and had all these restrictions on his creativity and he wasn't seeing any of the money from the huge sales 
he just decided to leave. It just wasn't, he wasn't being paid enough for this to be worth the hassle of having to fit all these demands. Yeah, that's as I understand it. And, and that's exactly the right word, the hassle. And then, you know, you've got an artist that, the, the, you know, the customer, the client, if you like, Lucasfilm, have specifically asked for, and he's kind of, you know, again, not being down on, on shaking, but he's, you know, he's been pretty sort of vocal and public about the fact that he did kind of dial it in. You know, he wasn't really that sort of, terribly interested in it at the time so yeah you can sort of see and in fact at the end of that arc uh roy didn't even script that it's based on a plot by by roy but the very last part so that would be what issue 10 is basically scripted by um donald f glutt who i know because he wrote the um empire strikes back novelization much you know a couple of years later so he'd even gone you know he'd he'd washed his hands of it uh, you know, by that point. And it's interesting to speculate what we might have seen if Roy had stayed with the book, but it's also kind of mm. difficult to figure out because uh, we have so little to go on. I mean, I like Roy's run on it. I One of the things I really like about it is that there's a sort of a, a literary sort of quality to his narration. And you see that particularly in the um, movie adaptation, but even in the, you know, that first uh, Star Hoppers of uh, Aduba 3 arc there's a sort of yeah like a poetic kind of a breathless sort of bent to his writing which i really like does he get all of the characters i think he gets some of them really well others you know again maybe not so well but again i think it's because you know these personalities that star wars aesthetic was not that well defined his chewbacca for instance is is very much just a sort of like a barbaric kind of berserker kind of rage filled creature you know there's none of that sort of loyalty and slightly sort of gentler side that we now associate with with chewbacca but then you know he's basing that off the first movie where we're sort of told that oh if you you know you annoy him he's going to rip your arms out of the sockets and things like that so you know he can be forgiven for for, for writing Chewbacca like that but it doesn't quite sort of align with what we what we think of uh, when it comes to um Chew Chewbacca as well uh, and the other thing I was just going to say going back to Jackson and you know you were talking about um the sort of comedy punning sort of you know Don Juan Quixote name, but of course Jackson is is kind of a play on that because he obviously he's he's like Space Bugs Bunny basically, and he even comes from the planet uh, Coachella Prime because apparently in some of the Bugs Bunny cartoons there was something to do with like Coachella, uh, and then later on when when Jackson comes back for the for that one off issue, he he runs into some gangsters that are called like Fud, as in like Elmer Fud, and and even when he's like captured, he's hanging upside down, and he says, "I'd ask what's up," but it seems like I am, which obviously is a riff on you know what's up, Doc. So there was that going on with Jackson as well. It wasn't just Don Juan Quixote; it was like this sort of punning kind of riff you know on uh, on an established character for whatever the reasons were i think we've gone into them quite a bit roy thomas was off the book by issue 10 so with issue 11 we get a whole new creative team something we'll discuss next episode that's it for this time of course i'd like to thank my special guest the confessor i uh, hope you liked listening to this discussion next time around we'll be bringing you part two which uh where we cover um up through i think issue 38 but don't quote me on that uh so that'll be something um that i hope you'll enjoy uh so look forward to seeing what you think leave your comments down below and uh thanks for watching